Well, let's get started. Hi, I'm Peter. Um, I've been a um, contributor to the Postgres project since 1999. Um, and I want. Mic fix. Hello. So you can reach me at these uh, addresses. Just feel free to say hi afterwards or send me a question afterwards. Thank you, David, for the laptop because I didn't have one with HDMI. So. And so I'm going to talk about how, how Postgres is tested. So if you've been here for the previous talk by Simon, that's yeah, he, he introduced you to how you can uh, write a patch. And then this is more of a deep dive into how, how we make sure afterwards that uh, the feature works and continues to work. So this is a little bit of an archaeology talk, in a way, of how we, how we got where we are now. So the, the first reference uh, to testing is uh, Postgres 4.2, which I downloaded the other day. Uh, you can still get that. That's the last release that came out of the University of California at Berkeley. So you can download that from their website. And that, still already, had a that already ha has a test suite in it that we effectively still use today to a large degree. That's what we nowadays call the regression test suite, right? So th that already was included way back then. So that, that's not a new thing at all. And a lot of, if you, do, if you look into the test code in the, in, in the details of the regression test suite, there's a lot of stuff like street addresses in California and, 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 and coordinates of sort of geometrical coordinates of, of things that related to the, the university at the time. So they already did a lot of that work. So, the, the source code layout in the Postgres 4.2 was slightly different. So nowadays, we have the main test suite, the regression test suite, in under source test regress. And that has uh, subdirectories that look like this. And, and this is a repeating pattern, which I'll, I'll come back to later. So this is a pretty simple idea. You know, and this was developed in the, you know, early 90s or even maybe even late 80s. So that was before we had all uh, sort of the, the, all the fancy testing tools that we have today. So you have three subdirectories, SQL, results, and expected. And the SQL subdirectory contains a bunch of SQL files. And the test, when you run the test, all those SQL files are executed using the PSQL, PSQL uh, command line tool. And then the, the output is captured. Just whatever it prints out is captured. And that is uh, stored in the results folder. And then that is compared just using a text comparison against what is in the expected folder. And if that all matches, then pass, test pass. And if it doesn't, then you have to dig in. Right? So and th th that's that. That's how we've been doing testing for, for lo the longest time. And to execute that, you can uh, run the command called uh, make install check. And that was sort of the original setup. Um, you, you first had to basically, you first had to build Postgres, install Postgres. You have to set up a Postgres server, run NAD, you know, make a directory, run NADB, start it up. And then you can run make install check, which runs that test suite that I just described against the running Postgres server. And that used to be very complicated because it's like eight steps to actually get there, right? You have to build the code, install the code. You have to make a directory. You have to run in a DB. You have to start the server. You have to make sure it actually starts, uh, finishes starting up. And then you have to go back to the other window, and then you run make install check and, and, and so on. So that, and, and it, before, uh, even away all days, you still ha you had to set like some library paths and, and all kinds of other weird stuff. So this was sort of a you know an eight to ten step process to actually run the test, which was very complicated. So one of the first sort of great advances in this, in a way, which we might laugh about now, but is in uh, seven point release, uh, make check was introduced that automates all of what I was just described. And that, that's what we really want to do, right? If you have to have a repeat, if you have a repeating process, then we just automate it, right? So make check, builds and installs everything in a temporary place, and then runs those tests. So it's basically only one command that does everything. And that, that's great. That's what we want. 
And the other uh, thing that was introduced uh, that make Jack introduce sort of at the, at the same time, but not really related to that, is that it runs some of those tests in parallel. So there is a certain way these things are scheduled. So in, the, in that SQL subdirectory, there are, I, I don't even know how many there are, there's like 40, 50 files maybe in there right now. And it is sort of set up manually that the test runs some of those in parallel. Not really in a way that they interact with each other, so it doesn't do anything like that. That's something we will come to later, how you actually test multi-session behavior. It just sort of, well, let's just see what happens, right? We'll throw a bunch of things in there in parallel, and we'll see if, if uh, even just, you know, you can even have more than one session, and, and does the locking work just basically right if you have multiple things going on? And so it, it's sort of more an opportunistic kind of, we'll just throw a bunch of stuff in there once and see if the system uh, stays up. Then it, the other effect nowadays is actually, so that was the, that was the idea back then. It's like, do we even like hold up with many sessions? But nowadays it's also, it's actually faster to run stuff in parallel, right? If you have N CPUs, then just running N things, is, it's gonna be a little bit faster just to, and, and that's something we want. We wanna get the tests run as quickly as possible just to, so we can, uh, use it as part of development. So all of this uh, logic is in a program called PG Regress, which is also in that uh, subdirectory source test regress, um, that used to be, like many things in Postgres, used to be a small shell script, and then it became a big shell script, and now it's a big C program, because it had to be ported to Windows. So, and, and that contains all that logic of you know, taking these SQL files, running them through PSQL, starting the server beforehand if necessary, running the diff afterwards gives you a nice print output, and, and that's what PG Regress does. So it, it's uh, basically a custom test driver that we wrote over time. So the way this test, uh, this test, you know, we have 20 years of Postgres, and, and university Postgres was before that, so that's, you know, it has held up quite well but it has lots of problems in terms of uh, what you can test with it. So for, first of all, you can only test things that you can somehow, is, are somehow exposed via the SQL command interface. So you, there, there are a lot of tests in there that test all kinds of things. Can you create a table? What about this data type? What if I put a text input into an integer? What, you know, geometry types, network types, all these different edge cases. Insert, update, delete, joins, does it actually join the stuff in the right way, and, and all these different complicated queries, all that stuff you can test, great. Right? Like you can, you, you know, foreign keys, does it really work if I cascade things, all those things you can test, great. But anything that's not SQL, you can't test that way. So anything that is background behavior, vacuum is a good example always, or any front end tools, PG dump is not part of this at all, right? So. It's only that. Next problem is that it, it, the test always has to print out exactly the same thing because of the way the, the, the diffing works, right? We just take capture the output and compare it with the output that we had before, and it has to be exactly the same. So anything that doesn't, that has sometimes different behaviors it, is a problem, and there's multiple reasons why this could be. Uh, some, sometimes you just, you know, you, you have, there's sort of certain randomnesses in the way statistics are collected sometimes. In, or what happens on the system at the same time. If a vacuum runs in the background at the same time, some, some things might change. The, the, the plans might change as, as, as a result of that, or the, the, the scan order might change. And then one easy way around some of those problems is, well, you just put an order by at the end of every query, right? That's sort of a, a beginner's uh, suggestion. It will just, well, we'll just order by, and then the order is gonna be consistent. But then if you order everything, then all, you only test things that actually do sorting, and you don't test other plans. So that, that's a problem. You don't want to just order everything. Um, so th that's a hard balance to strike there. So there are sometimes platform differences, especially in sort of floating point behavior. So there are a couple ways to work around that. There's a, there's a, a way to have different expected files for different platforms, and, and, and that mostly has to do with things like the floating point or sometimes the time zones are configured differently, so that's kind of an annoying thing you have to take care of. Um, if, you, if you configure Postgres differently, 
you might have different output. Like if you, if, for example, if you configure without XML, all the XML tests will fail. Most of them actually, some of them will not fail. Um, uh, so you need to account for that somehow. One, one annoying thing is if you, if you have an external library that is used somehow, for example, the XML library or Python library for PL Python, if they change, something might change and then the error message might look different. So th then the straightforward diffing doesn't work anymore. So you have to maintain a lot of different output files or you have to write your tests in a more clever way. So those are all problems you have to battle with that. And, and the, the, the last point there is, in a way, this is the wrong way to do test-driven development. Because the, uh, the ideal way to do test-driven development is, is you write the tests first, and then you make the code match the test, right? That's how you're supposed to do it. And you, I guess you could sort of do it that way, but it's really hard to do it that way, because you, you, the normal way you, you work with this is that you write your code, and then you run it, and then you write some tests, and then the test will fail because the output isn't there yet. So it's just going to be a diff of empty versus whatever it prints out. And then you look through that and say, oh, yeah, that looks right. And then you copy that from, uh, from results to expect it. So you, co you copy the exact output file from results to expect it. And then you run it again, the test will pass, hopefully. So that's more like it's not really a m proper sort of test-driven approach of like, I, I want the code to do this. It's more like, well, this is, the, this is what the code did last time, actually, somebody checked. And that, now we'll just record that for forever. So, yeah, but th th that's how it works. So nonetheless, this has been a very popular approach. So it has spread around to we, we test all kinds of different modules and extensions that way now. So the first uh, tests that were written this way were in, in 6.5, the multi-byte tests, so the tests different encodings. and. Uh, in 7.1, the first, uh, the first uh, contrib modules had, had tests that way. So they have their own SQL expected result, and you run make check in there, and then it just tests. They're very small, usually. They just said test that, that whatever that module is doing it works the way the author thought. And that has spread, spread uh, around almost all contrib modules, many if not all, almost all ex separately distributed extensions have tests like that. So if you download an extension and they have a test, it probably looks like that. So if you want to make a change to you know, any extension module that works like that, you download it, you run the test. If you want to make a change, you do it the exact same way. You, run, you, you edit, the edit the SQL file, run the test, copy the results over if you're happy, and then submit the patch back. So that, that's how many, almost all extension modules are tested in Postgres. Um, so almost forgot about ECPG like many people do, but the, the, guy, the, guy, who, the guy who wrote those, uh, those tests is actually a friend of mine who I'm staying with at his house in Manhattan, so I figured if I don't mention that, he's not going to let me back in tonight. So there was a Google Sum of Code project to test um, ECPG, which is the embedded C preprocessor. And it works the same way, kind of, but the, the input and the output is, is, is different, but it works the same way as like we have an input file, we run it, and there's two stages to this. You, first, you take the, the source file, you run it through the preprocessor, you get an output file. You can compare that against what you expected, and then you actually run the program, and then you compare the output of that program. So it, it kind of takes the same. It shares some of the, some of the code with PG Regress. It takes the same approach, just has a bunch of input files, runs them through two stages in this case, and then compares the output. So, and that's, that it has very, very good test coverage of all the different features in ECPG, so it's quite well tested. So, and as Simon mentioned earlier, we, we to kind of put the, all of this together. We, so we have these different test suites, which sort of test features. And then we have the other axis is, is portability. So we have, you know, Postgres runs on all, all kinds of different operating systems, CPU architectures, different configurations, old versions, new versions of operating systems, and things like that. So 
we have, uh, in order to be able to know that it runs on all these platforms, what we used to do is we, in sort of the before 8.0 days, so in the, in the days of uh, 6.x and 7.x uh, era, when I got started, we, we, before the release, when the, when the release came around, when it was sort of beta or so, we sent out an email, like, so guys, it's time to test. So if anyone has an odd box, an odd operating system, please test Postgres and report back. And then we used to collect these emails and sort of maintain a list, like, OK, somebody tested on Spark, somebody tested on Debian, somebody tested on SUSE. OK, but so oh, and nobody has tested yet on NetBSD on Alpha, so we'll send out another email. It's like, does anyone have a Net NetBSD Alpha around, sitting around? It's like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll find one. I have some over here. So th that was a very manual process. And then in, at some point, somebody automated that, as we do. And that was uh, Andrew Dunstan has uh, led the effort. Is Andrew here? No. So. Uh, uh, and so the build farm is basically the automation of that process. People have old boxes, usually old boxes, lying around somewhere that are not necessarily doing a whole lot. And they put this build farm client on it, which just builds Postgres on the schedule that they set themselves, and reports back via a simple little protocol to the build farm server, which you can find at that address. And then it shows, you know, red, green, other colors of, of what happened. And then at so the, I don't ex exactly know when it got started, but the, the reason I put sort of these uh, releases on there is I, I saw in the release notes of 8.0, that was the first time we mentioned the build farm in the release notes. So instead of having this list of, oh, this guy said he tested on NetBSD uh, Spark or whatever, and this guy said he tested on SUSE on Alpha, it's like we started actually mentioning, well, this was actually just tested automatically on the build farm. And in 8.3, actually, we did away with this email emailing stuff around. We did away with that altogether. So as of 8.3, the build form is it. So the build form tests whatever. If we claim to support a certain platform, we, the, the build form proves it. And if it's not on the build form, we can't really say anything about it. So and build form is a great project. It's been a great resource. There's some issues with that, one of which is that most of the build form boxes are old and sort of so are sort of donated because they're not doing anything else. So they're usually quite slow and the hardware is fragile sometimes. So it's, it's not sort of something that, a, you know, maybe a commercial company would just buy new servers as build servers, right? So we kind of rely on sort of old and weird boxes to do a lot of that work. So, and and the, other, the other issue at times is that these boxes are in someone's basement or data center somewhere, so we don't have actually access. We just rely on them to maintain them. And if they break, they have to hopefully fix them, or oftentimes they're just trashed at that point because they're so old. And so, so we can't really control this process. We just kind of hope that people do it themselves and report back or, or make these, uh, keep, uh, maintain these boxes. So let's uh, think of, uh, for a moment of, of why we test. And, uh, yeah, well, obviously we want to test to know if it works, but who are who are really the stakeholders? And uh, for I initially, in, in, the, in the old in the old days, we just needed to know whether it works at all, and then we needed the build farm to know whether it works on all these other variants that other people might need to know. So when the release came around, we just needed to see like, does it actually work still? Um, but I think over time, there, there's been other stakeholders, and, and there, there, there are many, and you know, one of which is just developers themselves. You, you want to have some, if you want to work on a piece of code, you want to, hopefully there's already a test for it there, which if, if, if you write code, if you write a new feature, or you write tests for it, it's that great. But if or, there's already a test for it, that's even better, because then you know you haven't broken anyone else's stuff that they have done in the past. So it is also, it's for your own development process. It is for other developers to know what you're doing. And then it's for the release effort, the release team to know whether all that stuff together still works months later on all these different platforms. And, and then it goes out to packagers that build it in slightly different ways. And they want to still know that they didn't mess it up, right? Because they are sort of the, the, the representatives of the project at that point. They, we, we ship a source tarball, but the packagers really take that work and, and, and actually sort of give it to the end users in a way. And so they want to make sure they didn't mess it up. And then the, the, uh, 
the users, at time, sometimes, the, oftentimes the users just take it and, and assume it works, but often, many users just want to run the tests themselves to know in, that it, whatever, however they installed it in whatever way they thought they want to install it, it still works. And then there's uh, uh, commercial companies that do stuff with Postgres, they package it themselves, or they fork it, or they build other products around it. And they, as I've learned, they use a lot of that same the same test drivers for their stuff. So if, if, if there, some company might add additional functionality in the backend server or add extra modules, and, and they, in many cases, they just use the same PG regress driver to, to test it. So all of those different ways of, of looking at, at testing are, 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 that need to be catered to. So which yields to, so my follow up uh, to what uh, Simon said earlier is uh, I, I, this, this, uh, each patch should come with these, if appropriate, with these uh, things. Obviously, you want to write some code and you want to write some documentation so people know what, what it is. And, but, but you should think, and I think we're ready for that, that you should, should think if, if whatever I'm sending doesn't, have, doesn't affect, doesn't have a test or changes an existing test, then they're, they're, you should be sad. Or, or if it's a bug fix, ideally there is a test that can to somehow prove that there was a bug and that you have now fixed it, right? So, and then my personal pet peeve is uh, if you send a patch, please also send a commit message with it. Because then if I have to commit it or some other committer, I don't have to write the commit message myself and I might then totally misrepresent uh, what you actually meant by the patch. That uh, takes, a, it takes a lot of time to you know, when you sit there in the evening, you want to actually just close that patch out, but then you have to write half an, a little bit of an essay on behalf of somebody else to explain why this is all so awesome and how it fits in. So if you could just send a commit message with your patch, that would be great. So uh, so that was sort of the uh, up to, you know, the 8.x releases. In, and, and then at some point, somebody thought, well, we have all these tests, but now I have to go through and find all these different tests. So I, I make a change, I want to make sure I didn't break anything, but then there's like all these different tests I have to find to run them. And so we came up with make check world, which actually runs all the tests. So that just basically goes through, you know, all the different modules and contrib, the backend tests, ECPG, and whatever else comes around and tests everything. So that's really what you ought to use going forward to test everything sort of as the Obviously, as you just, if you know you're hacking on some contrib module, you're going to run that test over and over again as you, as you code. But the very end, sort of when you're ready to, to submit or you're ready to go, just, just run that to make sure everything is still fine. And so, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of problems with the regression test uh, driver approach of, of what it can test. So, at some point, one of, the, one of the biggest problems that had, al had always been talked about is that you can't test multi-session behavior. You can run stuff in parallel and hope it doesn't break each other's stuff, but you can't do, test any kind of locking or concurrency behavior, which is obviously a very important aspect of, of relational databases of Postgres. There's a lot of different details with isolation levels and, and locking and different kinds of locking, all that, all that stuff is, is very important that it works, obviously, and, and, but we can't easily test that, or couldn't. So in, in 9.0, we kind of built a new, kind of took a framework that was already existing and sort of ported it into our framework, uh, which is under source test isolation. And, and that is a, is a sort of a, a custom test driver that can do concurrent tests. So it runs multiple sessions, and then this guy takes a lock, and then we'll see if that other guy actually waits, something like that. Or well, this guy runs something in this isolation level, and this other guy runs something in this other isolation level, and then there's ways they can make sure they're at the right position. Uh, and, uh, and then you see, can this guy see what that other guy did, or sh sh should he see what the other guy did, all that kind of stuff. Right? And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of stuff in there by now that's been added to over time that so there, there's, so the, the, the original 
sort of idea for this framework came from the Postgres R project, which is a replication project that uh, is a, sort of a fork of Postgres that existed for a long time. Uh, but I think the, the original sort of the urgency to adopt this came about when the, uh, I, I believe it was when the uh, serializable isolation level was implemented. So the, the true, what they call the true, the true serializable isolation level. Uh, and and the, the developer or the people who contributed to the development and the patch review at the time thought like, this is all great and this is awesome, you've done all this work, but we can't really know, I, I can't see, what, how, I can't test this, right? It's very hard to set up a concurrent session. It's like, okay, I do this, I do that, okay, that seems to work. But there's a lot of depth in that feature, right, that you need to somehow be able to test more automatically. So, so we added the isolation test driver, and then over time, other people sort of added their own tests onto that for, for, for locking and, and, and things like that. So in 9.2, uh, in we added that a test for PG upgrade, and that, that was sort of, I, I myself worked on that, and it came about in an unrelated way that I was working on some other feature, and it turned out weeks after it was committed or that somehow PG upgrade was broken. So if you, it was some uh, alter table feature, I believe it was, and so if you altered your table in this way, then afterwards if you run PG upgrade, it doesn't, it doesn't know what to do with it, there's, so there's some problem. And so, we, you can, okay, we realized that problem, we fixed it, but there was really a, 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 a problem to realize that if, if, I ha if we hadn't found this particular problem, that some other stuff might have broken PG upgrade and we would have learned half a year or a year later when we were ready to release. Like, yeah, did anyone actually check that PG upgrade still works? I don't know, some, somebody will, would have probably done that at some point, but that's, that, that's sort of the problem that there's this tool that at the time we wanted to push for people to do the upgrades, but in, we, there was no automatic test, automatic, automated tests for it. In, or, in, in order to test it, it's a fairly complex manual process, right? You have to set up a server and you have to put some stuff in it and configure it and you have to put, set another server and you have to run PG upgrade with all these options and then, oh, you did it wrong. Okay, so I have to do it all again. So basically what I did, I automated that. I wrote a shell script essentially that uh, does that, right? It, it, it runs, it sets up a server, loads a bunch of stuff into it, runs upgrade, PG upgrade, and then see if that works. So and that's, that, that's been quite valuable over time because it actually tests a bunch of other stuff in it, in it as well. As part of the whole process, a lot of other tools and stuff has to be touched. So <laughs> whenever that fails, it doesn't necessarily mean that PG upgrade is broken, but some other stuff that is part of this whole process actually breaks. So that, that's quite useful. Um, so, we also added tests in 9.2 for in, in libpq, and that was also one of those things where we just said, like, we, we, we need a test for this. This is all a great feature, but I'm afraid it'll be broken before we know it. And that was uh, some you know, new contributor said, sent a patch so you could use URLs as a connection string in libpq. Great, great feature, great idea. So you can do PostgreSQL colon slash slash server name slash and then okay and then there's lots of corner cases there right like you got to do percent encoding and slash encoding and what do you do with the pluses and the spaces and how do you do local sockets and and what if you don't have a host but you have a poor what about IPv6 parsing and there's a lot of lot of details in there and then and, and just as the patch reviewer. Like, how do I test all this? I have to type all these things in. It's like, oh, it's, okay, that works. Okay, that works. Okay, nah, that works. And then uh, somebody's, you know, then the next v version of the patch comes in. It's like, oh, I have to try all these things again. And then, no. So we just say, right, we got to have a test for this. And it's pretty straightforward to test, right? You just have a bunch of URLs and you, you parse them, have the code parse it, and then see if the output is fine. So that, that's great. I have. You know, I have good confidence in that feature still that it still works the way we originally committed it because we, we have all these tests. So that, 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 was, that was good. We don't unfortunately have not many tests for other stuff in libpq. But of course libpq is part of like PSQL and that's part of the whole suite. So we know that libpq generally works, but some of those details are, are uh, important to test uh, separately. And, and so this is the, the, the latest and greatest uh, addition, which 
I was involved in. Um, that we, we didn't have a, we didn't have any tests for any of the non-server tools. So we 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 test the server and all that SQL stuff. We we have a test for PG upgrade, and we have you know we know that PSQL generally works because it runs all those files. But we have no we don't know anything about how you know create DB or vacuum DB or PG base backup and all these tools. We have no, we have no way to test it. So and again, it came sort of out of a need. I, I was reviewing a patch from someone uh, uh, for. Um, PG base backup. So for those who don't know, PG base backup takes a, a base backup of the server, and then you can use that as a just either as a backup, or you can use it more usually as a start for a, a replication slave. So it's sort of the first part of setting up a replication slave, really. And somebody sent a patch so you could map table spaces differently on the slave. So you have the table spaces that point to certain directories, but then maybe if you want to set up the slave, you want to have them point to a different directory. So that's a reasonable feature. How, how do you review that? I have to set up my own, I have to set up a server, make sure replication is turned on, set up another server, make sure the replication is here. I have to run my base backup, make sure it's all the different pieces configured. So it takes me just you know 15 minutes just to set up a test harness locally. And then something breaks, I have to do the whole thing again. Again, so I was like, oh, I got to automate this. And so I wrote some tests for that. And, that, and, and, and there's, in, in that particular patch was also one of those things that were a lot of corner cases in terms of how the mapping is parsed. So you can say, well, this directory equals that directory. What happens if you have an equal in the directory name, right? Different cases. All this stuff has to be tested. So instead of having the patch reviewer type all that stuff in, we just said, well, we'll just write tests for that. And so the way we implemented this, obviously we could have just had another shell script like we did for PG Upgrade. But at this time, it was clear we needed something a little bit more you know, forward looking in a way. And it needed to run on Windows too. That was one of the problems with, uh, with the, uh, the, the PG Upgrade stuff is almost like a quick hack. Well, here's a shell script that tests this. Well, let's just keep it. Whereas this, you know, with all this experience, like let's write something that also works on Windows, hopefully works on different platforms, and it's sort of a better way to sort of report failures and things like that. So we took the basically the test modules from Perl, and and the, the naming here is confusing because tap we call them the tap tests, but tap is actually a protocol, the test anything protocol that just reports test results. So the way these tests actually work is they're just Perl scripts, essentially, that does stuff and reports what they found, right? And it's a, it's a Perl program. You can, do any, you can do anything with it. But generally, the way it works is you, you just run the program with different options, and then you can check if anything happens. So it gives you complete freedom of what you can do, right? So you want to you run PG base backup with a totally fake option that doesn't even exist. And then you can just check if there's an error message. You run PG base backup with this other option that sets up a slave, and then you just check if there's actually something that was copied there, right? That's what the result of that was. And then you run it with these new options that we were just developing at the time and make sure that in this combination, well, the table space is actually mapped to that place. And in this combination, it actually reports that th this directory doesn't exist. And there's a lot of, lot of the cases, right? So, and uh, some of these ideas were taken from other projects. Uh, so, and, in 9.4, that was the first time we added those. We added small tests across different uh, front-end programs. So we added some for you know, PG config, PG CTL, PG base backup, you know, create DB, uh, create lang, and all these different things, just to make sure they work. And in a way, those tests were not super useful, but it gave us the opportunity to actually work out how this test framework should actually work and, and make it portable and all these things. And in a way, it turned out quite successful because people other than myself have added on to that greatly. So in 9.5, we added a test suite for SSL. Again, that's one of those things. If somebody sends a patch that changes something in SSL, like, oh, I want to change. I want, here is an option to check some other certificate in some other way. Right? There's a lots, of, lots of ways like that in SSL. 
It's like, oh, that's, that's great. So now you want me to set up SSL locally so I can replicate that? That doesn't sound very attractive. And then ultimately, those kind of patches just linger around. Nobody wants to look at them. Like, I don't want to set up some SSL stuff here to just look at your thing. So now we have a test suite that does all that. It runs through all different cases, like make a certificate, make another certificate, have a revoked certificate, see if that does it work. Does the authentication work that way? Does it actually, what if you have client certificate and server certificate, no server certificate, an outdated certificate, all these things. So it's great. So now if somebody sends an SSL patch, I'm much more willing to actually look at it because I, I have some way to actually test it, make sure it doesn't break anything. I have an fairly easy way to add more tests. So hopefully the original developer already added some more tests to describe what that feature changes. And, and, and so it's much easier to review stuff like that. And, and lot, you know, SSL is kind of stuff you want to have some confidence in that you didn't break it. And just the latest stuff that came, uh, came in just a couple weeks ago was a, actually a replication test. So that's very important. That your replication actually works, right? You can set up two servers and you put some stuff in here and it comes out there, right? It's good to know. Until now, that was usually manual work. Somebody sends you a te test, well, I have a new way to configure replication in some way. Like, I want to have a delay of some kind, right? Or something like that. So, like, okay, then I have to set up one here and I have to set up one there and then find the documentation for your new option. And, okay, so I want to have a 30 second delay. So, Let's run as like, okay, I'll just wait 30 seconds. Like, oh, I actually came back after 20 seconds, so that doesn't work. So that, so that stuff is super annoying to test manually, right? So that was sort of a, a, for a long time we've been waiting and somebody now recently contributed a, a beginning of a test suite for that. So it just sort of, there's lots more stuff to replication in Postgres, obviously, that we could add on, but at least we have something to work with. So. So this is sort of the, the zoo that we kind of work with. So we, there was a lot of, you know, you can kind of put this in, in eras if you, if, you, if you wish. So in the sort of 7.x 7, 7 era, we kind of just figured out what we even need. And then the 8.x 8, 8 era was perhaps sort of the era of the build farm where we just really made sure we had automated platform coverage. And then in the 9.x era, we just wanted to just add a lot more depth to testing just to make sure we actually have a lot of tests for everything ultimately, right? And, and, and so some of those, we have sort of a proliferation of different approaches to that now. So perhaps it's a little bit of a future project to consolidate some of that. So an obvious project, for example, would be to take the PG upgrade tests and re-implement them in, the, in the, the, the Perl tab framework to just get rid of a lot of sort of duplication and custom hacks there, and perhaps also these uh, LibPQ tests could be uh, moved that way. I haven't looked into that exactly, but sort of the, you know, we don't need five and a half ways of testing. Maybe three would be enough. And there's more testing outside of the Postgres project, right? So the, the, the packagers do testing, hopefully. I know the Debian project, uh, with the original packager, Martin Pitt, and, and others who have helped, uh, has, has a very decent test suite of whatever the packaging adds. So it makes sure you know you install the package, it actually puts stuff in the right directories, you start it up, it actually runs, you stop it again, you have different locale configurations and all these things. It's, it's a very good test. And actually, a lot of the Perl tap stuff was kind of stolen from that by me. So Because I, I had a lot of experience with that, and I knew how to work with it and how it would work. and it's, it's been useful, so just you know, took that approach. I know a lot of companies that distribute Postgres, redistribute Postgres, have QA teams internally that do automated and manual testing, and sometimes they report back and find additional bugs, especially stuff that's hard to, or has been hard to test automatically, like replication stuff, for example. There's a lot of man, sort of manual or, or sort of custom testing that they do, and. As an open source project, sort of the, the, the founding myth of open source was that you have your users test, right? And uh, I, I think we have learned over the decades that that doesn't really work so well, at least for a database project the way Postgres works, right? It's if you have, there, there are, other, there are other, other pieces of software, if you have like, it's like an editor or something, right? And you bring out the new version of 
VI, whatever, right? And it doesn't work. Okay, well, you go to the previous version, it's fine. Just new version is crap. I'm not going to use it. But if you, if you have a new version of Postgres out and you've upgraded, you took, you're taking your downtime, you upgraded everything, and you, 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 know, you converted the data or whatever, and, and then it's like, oh, it, that doesn't work. Moving back is very hard, right? So we, we, we can't, I mean, we obviously, you, feedback from users is, is, is always useful and necessary, but we can't have users do basic testing that it works, right? If, and, and, and there's also this sort of problem, like, who, who moves first, right? The users don't want to upgrade until they know it's ready, but we can't really know if the users are going to be happy with the new code until they upgrade. So, if, you know, the, the, the best case scenario is you, you, you have whatever app your internal application is, you have, a, you have a test suite for that, right? If you, if you have an app and a website or whatever, maybe you have some automated way to test that kind of thing, well, then you just plop the new Postgres in, run the tests with that, Hopefully it still works. You report back, it's like, yeah, I'll test it. Postgres 9.6 uh, works great for us. Go forward. Um, but the reality of you know, how business works, how software development works, not everyone has that. Not everyone has the resources to, even if you have that, not everyone has the resources to do that. So th it, it's hard. So there's also this whole bunch of other stuff you might have heard of or seen, uh, which is not testing the, in, in that sense, it's sort of more code analysis and stuff. So if you're interested in that, there's a talk I gave a couple years ago. You can follow, there's a link on the slides or just go to PGCon 2014, there's a talk about that. So that's maybe sort of a, a, another aspect to quality that you just you know, do sort of static analysis or, or, or as Ballgrind does, like memory leak checking and things like that. So that's sort of very, more of a low level approach. So I don't want to talk about that too much. Test coverage uh, is, again, you can talk a lot about test coverage just as a reminder of how it works. You can run the first command to kind of clean up what you had previously, then you run whatever tests you have, and then you run make coverage HTML, which gives you an HTML report of your test coverage. Actually, you have to, I didn't put that in here, you have to run configure with certain options to make that work, so the code is instrumented for that. And it's in the documentation of how to do that. And there's, um, there's actually a new, just as of uh, yesterday or so, a new website that is coverage.postgresql.org where those, that kind of information is, is, is looked at. And as Simon mentioned in a previous talk, you know, one way if you want to kind of get involved into this, and if you want to get involved in the Postgres contribution and you're interested in expanding the quality of the tests, just take a look at that. And you will surely find lots of places that are not tested. So then you can start there. And so these URLs, you can, uh, there's a blog post and some uh, Jenkins server that I run myself that has sort of similar information. And in, in reality, I mean, we, some people look at that sometime, but we have by no means any kind of idea of what kind of coverage we really have or what we should be aiming for. So this is just sort of a, uh, advanced gimmick uh, in a way at this point. So here's a whole bunch of stuff where, that we don't have good testing for. And a lot of these could easily be your first project or some of code project, but I, th I don't think we're in the, some Google some of code this year, but you know, any, any, if you want to just pick up something, a lot of these are totally doable. So we don't have any good testing for PG dump, which is really scary in a way if you think about it. Uh, PG dump is actually tested as part of the PG upgrade test because the way that works is that it runs the upgrade and it dumps the old server on the new server and it diffs them. So we know that PG dump generally works, but there's a lot of, a lot of uh, edge cases, as you might imagine, of you know, corrupted catalogs or something is missing or you, you have a table that you upgraded three times, it dropped the column, added the column, dropped the column, added some inheritance, removed inheritance. Can we still dump that? Can we still restore that? I don't know. So we could add more, more variance to PG upgrade testing. We could do, uh, one thing that would be really good is if we could actually PG upgrade across different versions, right? Right now PG upgrade just upgrades from the same version to the same version, which is useful because it exercises a lot of code, but what we really want to know is can we up upgrade from old versions? 
And there's ways to do that manually, but you still have to you know, download the old code, install the new code versions, and then run the thing. So that would be great if that were automatic. A whole bunch of things like not all clients and tools are covered. For example, I was thinking of the other day, PG Reset XLock. That's a very special tool that you only use very rarely, and we don't really have good test coverage for that. So if you change something in the, the Postgres code in, in the wall or something, and, and do we know all the different options in PG Reset XLock still work? Do the, do the right thing? So I don't know. And a bunch of other things, you know, indexes, we, all kinds of functionality about vacuum. Does, does vacuum even do anything? There's no way to test that. Like, we know it runs, but does it actually remove the things it says to remove? Does it actually update all the different maps in the way that it's, it should? There's no automatic way to determine that. And crash recovery, you know, pull the plug. We, we now have virtualization everywhere, so that would be easy to do that way. I just pull the plug and see if it comes back up and behaves in the way we expect it to. Different configurations, you know, with all the different configure options and different versions. It was pointed out to me last week, LibTQ protocol would be interesting to test. There's, you know, obviously it is tested as part of the general using of PSQL, for example, but there's lots of different options in the protocol that uh, be useful. Act, uh, and uh, more stuff about replication, we could, uh, and we surely will uh, soon add more and more stuff about replication. One thing that would be interesting is all the different access control options like Kerberos and uh, PAM, LDAP. There was a patch, for example, in the last commit fest where somebody wanted to add something about uh, the Kerberos, the GSS API. Way. And it's like, well, that, that's great, but I, I, I can't really sit here and f for three days figure out how to set up a, a, a test Kerberos installation to, to look at your patch. Right? If, if there was some way to automate that, that would, that would be great for those kind of patches. We don't do any automatic performance testing at all. Many people have tried. It's very hard. We don't really do that. Oftentimes, we just get feedback from users like, oh, actually, in my workload, this is actually a lot slower than before. And then there's a lot of panic. So we, if we can find that out earlier, that'd be, that'd be great. Uh, more, more testing packaging. As I mentioned, Debian packages have pretty good, very good uh, test coverage. Other packages don't. I'm not going to name names, but I've been very upset. Um, a lot of extensions, as I mentioned, extensions have usually, usually have tests that are quite good, but they don't have sort of the build farm support and all that other stuff. Just uh, last week, I was compiling a bunch of extensions in 32-bit mode, for example, and that was not a pretty sight. Uh, so, because apparently nobody uses 32-bit anymore, but we obviously still claim to support it, and. Uh, I, I'm, 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 I was a bit scared about the results, actually, because a, a lot of compiler warnings about line and mit ma mismatches and pointers being cast in the wrong way and uh, that, that, that's, that sort of stuff you only find out if somebody runs into it later. So, and, and it's not obvious how to fix that because we can't put more load on the build farm and have everyone test their random extensions that way, so that, that's, there's not a good solution. And I, I got to finish, but just a couple of things I, I like to do. Again, I mentioned we have the testing zoo. We want to kind of put that into a more of a way that it's much easier to t see what tests we have, uniform way to report the results. Uh, and we want to run not only performance tests, tests about the performance, but we also want to have the performance of the tests better. So the tests run faster, so you can run them more often, add more tests. Or only add some of the tests, that would be great. So we don't have to run everything all at once, all the time. Just the faster the tests run, the more people run the tests, the more tests we can add, the better it will be. So that is that. So there's a lot of projects here for interested people. If, you know, just uh, find me later, I'll, I'll assign them. <laughs> any, any questions? I guess we are almost, we got a couple of minutes before lunch. anybody has any. No. There's one in the back. Uh-huh.
Mm. Yeah. Okay, so his test was about PG, PG backrest, which I believe is a backup manager for Postgres, right? It's an external project. And he has written a lot of tests around you know, replication, archiving, timelines, and, and, and where should those tests ultimately live. Um, yeah, obviously, a lot of that depends on the specifics. I think whatever, you know, all the interfaces that Postgres exposes for testing should live in the, in the Postgres source code, which we have now, you know, started that. So we have, like, some frameworks for that now. So I expect, certainly, there will be a lot more stuff coming that way in terms of all these details. And ideally, we could, I'm not sure if we can just move the code. I don't know how you've set it up, but obviously, a lot of those, a lot of those ideas should certainly be stolen, I, I think. Yeah. Um, it's not so much the, the, the actual regression test or backrest that I'm trying to do. It's just I spent a lot of time thinking about all yeah. the possible tests. And yeah. I think that's that's definitely useful. Like all the all that thinking, we should definitely adopt. Right? The code might look different, but the ideas is really often the hardest part. I would love to look maybe later. We can actually look through a code and, and, and see what we can do there. But that would, would that go towards the cap test? I think so. Yes. Yeah. Yes, definitely there. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, definitely. That, that would be super useful. Yeah, you can spend like the next two years just submitting patches for that. <laughs> there was a question over here? No. Cool. All right. Let's have lunch. Thanks.